Welcome to another Melbourne Cocoa Heads presentation. This month, Stuart Gladell talks about unit testing for iOS applications. So I'm not presenting from my iDevice, so I'm a little bit old-fashioned. Um, and, and I'm wearing a shirt and I have a presenter remote, which is far more professional than, than I usually am. Um, oh, my presenter notes are gone. Uh, this could be briefer than I, than I anticipated. Um, so this is basically inspired by, the, there was a thread on the Coca Heads list a couple of weeks ago where there's a brief discussion about unit testing. One of the comments was, hey, it'd be great to have a talk about this because, you know, we all know unit testing is a good idea, but uh, it's a little bit hard and no one does it for iOS anyway. Um, so I thought I'd try and give an introduction to unit testing. Um, as usual, I've had less time to prepare than I anticipated. Um, so for Sadat, it's probably not as technical as you would like. Um, <laughs> there's not heaps of code samples. Um, oh, so there's no code demos. I've tried to put the sample code up on here just because I wasn't sure how the code samples would come up um, on the TV. Um, so if we could organise tonight again, I would put me first and then hear Keith talk about awesome bundler stuff and then have Chris blow our minds with augmented reality because coming down from that to testing is, yeah, I'll forgive you if you fall asleep. Um, <laughs> Sure. So I looked back at the little snippet I gave Sean when I said I'd give a talk, and I said I'd talk about unit testing, OC unit. Um, I just stretched these slides from 1024 to 1920, so the layout's going to be a mess. Um, unit testing, OC unit, I said I'd talk about Kiwi, and I said I'd talk about running your tests from the command line. Um, and I will touch on all of those things, um, but I haven't had as much of a chance to look at Kiwi as I'd like, but it does look like an awesome library, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, I thought when I was writing this talk that maybe you'd think we've been here before. I gave a talk at the start of the year on testing with Frank, uh, which is more kind of high-level testing, testing the UI. And as Sean said, the, um, all the tools are moving so fast. At the start of the year, I would have said, use a combination of Frank and GH unit to do your testing. Um, and you know, all these new tools are coming out. KIF came out in the middle of the year. Kiwi came out in the middle of the year. Um, Cedar's got a lot better. You know, there's a whole lot of uh, new tools that we can use. Um, and so I, I talked a little bit um, at the Swipe conference about the kind of testing pyramid and, and where I think you should have the kind of weight of all your tests. And so I sort of see there being three main kind of styles of tests that you have in your iOS apps. You kind of have high level UI tests, your integration tests and your unit tests. Um, and I really see the unit tests as the workhorse of that. I think um, testing everything through the UI, if anyone's worked on a project has tried to do that for iOS or even just a kind of a browser test where you just get Selenium to do everything. It's just dog slow and when you have bugs, you don't know where they are. Um, and so all the libraries, uh, there's our layout problems coming to, to bite us. Um, so OC unit, GH unit, the GTM toolbox, and I see Kiwi and Cedar as being a little bit higher level than that still running unit tests, but they allow you to kind of talk at a slightly higher level about your tests. Um, so they're really the, the kind of the X unit tests versus the kind of aspect style uh, you know, describe kind of tests. Um, so, so why should we test in, in units at all? Um, I have this argument with, with Kevin O'Neill, who's not here, um, <laughs> which is good, because he'd heckle me. Um, we only care if the whole app works. So it doesn't matter if all your unit tests pass if your app doesn't work, which is true. Um, but I think the, the cost of testing at a much higher level and the cost of fixing bugs when you're testing at a higher level, the, you know, it's going to be a much greater cost. So I think the advantage of unit tests is they're really specific, testing small pieces of core functionality. And when one of them fails, you've only got to understand about 10 lines of code in that context. Um, and then you can actually go in and fix that bug. Whereas if you get some, uh, if, if you're running Frank and you just get some weird kind of end of file error because your app crashed in the HTTP server, got confused. Um, it's really hard to work out what went wrong. Um, so I think, yeah, all your unit tests passing doesn't mean your app's going to work, but I think the, the cost of unit testing is much lower than other types of testing, and it does give you a much greater reliability that when you plug things together at a high level, that your app is, is far more likely to work. And you can have those kind of high-level smoke tests 
to make sure that, yeah, you did actually connect all your, your working objects together properly. Um, the other thing I think in starting is that you should write your tests first and use your tests to design your code. Um, I really think if you're going to bother writing unit tests, it's just so much easier to write them first. Um, first, if you write them after, you'll never do it because your client sees, oh, it's working, cool, ship it. Um, and I think you're really missing out on one of the great benefits. I think there's a real fallacy that unit testing is just about verifying the behavior of your app and, and making sure that the functionality is working. I think a much bigger benefit is influencing the design of your code and actually being able to write testable code and actually um, sort of being the first consumer of the objects that you're writing. Um, so forcing yourself to write clean interfaces. Um, so those kind of things that we want in our code, like low coupling and high cohesion, um, if you don't have that and you start writing unit tests, you're quickly going to find that you, you haven't separated your concerns very well. And you know, if you start having to inject in you know, 10 mocks into your object to try and get to work properly, maybe that's a bit of a smell. You know? um, so I think there really is a massive advantage in writing your tests first. Um, and so there's a, there's a nice quote from Kent Beck on the C2 wiki that says, classes typically resist the transition from one user to two then the rest are easy. So if our goal is to write reusable code, when we write our tests, we automatically have two users of our code. We've got the tests and the actual app. And so, so Kent Beck kind of drove a lot of that, that test-driven development movement probably about 10 years ago now. Um, and so it was his kind of statement that actually this forces you to write reusable code from the start. Um, and the, the last thing is about getting fast feedback. So you, you make a change, did you break anything else? Getting that feedback really quickly. Let's say if you, if you can't hold your breath while your test suite runs from start to finish, then don't hold your breath that anyone's ever going to run it. Um, seriously, as soon as your test suite gets long, no one runs it. Um, so keep your, your tests small and short. And if they're proper unit tests, which means they're not talking to the file system, they're not talking to the network, um, not talking to the interface builder, um, then they are going to run quickly. You know, unit tests aren't doing really complex things. Um, maybe if you're doing funky image processing, augmented reality objects, you know, it might take a little bit longer. But for most of the apps that we do, kind of pushing JSON around through views, um, it's, yeah, they're going to run very quickly. Um, and I think it, it's really important that we get this kind of test-driven development cycle. So we, um, I'm not sure how that red comes out at the top, but the, the kind of red-green refactor cycle that we have. Um, so the red phase is really important. When we write a test, we need to see it fail. You know, the, if we never see it fail, it may, it may not be doing anything, especially in Objective-C where nil objects just seem to kind of just do nothing and then you don't see them anywhere. Um, you really want your test to fail so you know it's working and then write the code, get it passing, and then while you've got your test there, you may as well really take the, um, make use of that and refactor your code and clean up after yourself. Um, I've had rants various times about this kind of, that you have to clean up after yourself. And if you've got tests, like you may as well take that opportunity. Um, so I saw a quote on, on Twitter one day saying, you know, when, when you look at someone else's code kind of six months later, he thinks he was being pragmatic and you just think he's an idiot. Uh, and I think you don't want people to look at your code in six months' time and think you're, in, you're an idiot, even though you think you're being pragmatic, you know, you're just trying to get it out the door. So I think it's really important to use our tests um, to really kind of reap the benefit of that and clean up our code after we're done. Um, so that's kind of my introduction to the kind of concepts I want to talk about. Um, and the first comment of that is usually we're making iOS apps. Um, so. There's a bunch of things people say about that. I mean, some iOS apps are really small and really simple, and you know, there's always kind of benefits of that. Um, but the, the couple of comments that come up are that the, the tools aren't good enough. And I think, especially early on, that really put people off because the tools were terrible, um, especially if you wanted to do test-driven development and continuous integration, those kind of things. Um, I think Apple still doesn't get command, like running tests from the command line. They still make it hard. Um, but I think actually now, it, there's two, I was going to list all the frameworks there and they actually wouldn't fit. Um, you could take your choice of a whole number of frameworks to use. Um, but it, Apple's inbuilt kind of OC unit uh, testing within Xcode has really got to the point where I think you may as well use it. I think 
people have probably seen the post from the Long Weekend mobile guys. I'm not sure if they're here. But um, they're basically saying, you know, if you're starting a new project, don't use GH unit, use OC unit for all these reasons. Um, there's not, not a strong reason to convert old projects, but if you're starting a new one, you may as well use the inbuilt tool. Um, the, the kind of ability of just being able to press Command U and run your tests without changing anything is a, a real benefit. Uh, the next thing you hear is no one pays me to write tests. Um, so this is a quote from Sadat. We had, <laughs> uh, which is true. Um, that's actually US dollars in there. So yesterday that wasn't worth a lot, but today you're laughing. <laughs> Thank you, Italy. Oh, yeah. REA did. REA. Pay you to write tests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, REA pays me to write tests. <laughs> um, so either no one pays you to write tests or you don't have time to write tests. Um, and I think if your tests aren't helping you to write your software quicker, then you've got to find another way of doing it. I don't think the solution is to not do testing. I think the solution is to find a way that your tests actually help you go quicker. Um, you know, the, the tests are, are easier to write than your actual code, and I think that in the long run, your 90% of the life of your code is, is not when you sit down and write the functionality the first time, it's maintaining it over the coming years. I think if you can pay a little bit higher cost up front and make that maintenance much lower, then that's definitely going to pay off. And I think once you actually get used to the tools and used to that way of thinking of writing your tests, um, I think it actually makes it quicker the first time and then heaps quicker when you're doing the maintenance. Um, so the real thing is they, they pay you to write software that works. So you've got to work out how to do that as quick as you can with you know, greater reliability. And I think tests are a great way of doing that. Uh, should you always test everything? Um, probably not. Testing is kind of ultimately about <coughs> pragmatism. And I think you, know, you need to deliver software that works um, as quickly as you can. So there's plenty of good programmers that don't run a test. There's plenty of good programmers that don't do test-driven development. I'm not one of those kind of dogmatic guys that says I'm professional if you don't do it. Um, but for me personally, I think if you're working on big apps in teams that are going to be maintained at version 1, 2, and 3, um, I think it's really sensible. Uh, in terms of testing everything, probably not. Testing your model classes, I reckon, for me, is a no-brainer. It's not hard. You may as well do it. Testing your controllers, and maybe. Testing the way your kind of interface builder plumbing. I don't know. I've seen ways of doing that. I'm not convinced that testing, dragging stuff around an interface builder in code is efficient. Um, I've seen people write tests for your view layouts and making sure that you know, you've put boxes at the right pixel coordinates. Um, I, th I think that's unlikely that that's going to be a benefit. I think your eyes are much better at, at looking at those kind of layout issues. Um, and we used to see a lot of people writing tests for kind of memory management when they came, when they knew to Objective-C and they weren't used to manual reference counting and they'd come from like a test-driven um, and unit testing environment. They really wanted to test that they got their memory management right. Um, I don't know if anyone's tried that, but I don't think it ends well for most people. <laughs> um, and with Arc, you can't do it anyway, because you can't... What's that? Yeah, yeah. If you do that, don't, don't tell Kevin. Um, so I'm not saying you should test everything. I'm just going to show you a few things that I think you can test, maybe some ways of going about it. The examples are pretty simple. I didn't want to try and go into too much detail. Um, so I wrote a really simple little um, app. Hi, right, this is my comment on whether you should test everything. I say it depends, but I'm a consultant, so that's, that's what I always say. <laughs> just get me on site and then I'll make a decision. Um, so I just made it like a little Fibonacci number counter where you can kind of tap next and reset. Um, yeah, Fibonacci really. It's a pretty boring example. Um, we're not going to get an Apple Design Award <laughs> for this. Although I didn't use the default grey background, which is about as advanced as my design skills uh, will get. Um, so, getting started. I'm not going to do a live coding demo, um, so I'm just going to sort of go through some snippets of code and some tests that you could write. Um, but this is basically just a single view application you create from the template. And it's really easy to include unit tests in your project. You just check that box. A lot of you probably check that box and um, then never think about it again. But um, yeah, they check that box and it sets up the unit test for you. It's great. Um, and I did this in Interface Builder, which is why I've been mailing the 
about Kogo Head's list because I've never used Interface Builder before. <laughs> and even just making this, I got really confused. <laughs> um, if you've already started a project and you want to apply unit tests, um, I wrote a little blog post about trying to do that for an existing app. And um, that links to another blog post which actually had kind of sections of it in a bit more detail, but it didn't do everything that I needed. Um, so we're going to use OC unit, which used to be called send test or send testing kit, and in the code it still is called that. Um, so Apple, it was a third party thing from some Swiss company and Apple repurposed it, I think in Xcode two days, and brought it in. Um, they separate them into application and logic tests. I don't know if anyone actually uses that separation. Um, I would have thought application tests aren't unit tests anyway. Um, so anyway, it separates them out that way. The only difference I could really think of is that if you're doing, if you're writing a static library, you're probably going to have logic tests. And if you're writing tests in your actual app, it's likely they're going to be application tests only because they have to run in the context of a kind of UI environment. So it actually spins up your app in the simulator, but your unit tests still run independently of anything else that's showing in your app. Um, and so you, you check that box, you create a new project, you press Command U, and it runs your tests. And in the absence of a build light, you get a big red screen. Or maybe kind of pink in, on that. Um, I'm pretty colorblind, so. Um, or if you've got one of those evil build bunnies that I think the guys at Deloitte <laughs> demoed, you could even have one of them kind of talking to you or spinning its ears or something like that. Um, anyway, the default template that Apple gives you is a failing test, which is I don't know, I guess it prompts you to actually do something about it. So maybe that's not such a bad thing. Um, so I'm just gonna have a look at that, that sample test case that it has. I'm sure for some of you, it's gonna be super basic and you already know all this stuff. Um, but just to look at the structure of how you write your tests. So the send testing kit, so Apple you know, didn't rename all the classes, they just left them named as they were. Um, so you import send testing kit and then your tests are a subclass of the send test case. So it's kind of like if you've done Java testing back in kind of JUnit three days, we actually had to subclass the library, uh, subclass the object, sorry, to hook it into your tests. Um, and the runtime automatically picks them up. When you add them to your test target, um, it automatically gets picked up by Xcode and run. Um, and then we have that, that's the failing test that Apple basically puts in there, just an ST fail. And so there's basically a bunch of assert macros that are kind of statements of truth that you make about kind of the state of your applications. You might do a few um, calculations and then basically make the assertion of what you believe to be true. And if it's not, then it's gonna fail. Uh, and nicely in Xcode, you actually get the error kind of in line in your code. Um, so it's, it's quite nice to go and uh, test. Uh, it gives you some setup and teardown methods. So the same way that you should refactor your code, I think you should refactor your tests as well. Uh, there's probably a little bit of a balance in terms of, you know, Duplication in your code is mostly a bad thing. Duplication in your tests is kind of a balance because you want your tests to read really nicely. Sometimes a little bit of duplication I think is okay if that means that your tests kind of become an executable specification for your app and executable kind of examples. So uh, I'm a little bit less strict on, on the refactoring, but definitely um, if there's common setup code, pull it out into these methods. Um, so, some controller tests. There's basically two types of tests that I, I've tried to do on the controllers. One is to kind of um, create my own controller object without the nib, kind of an independent environment and try and do a proper unit test and basically um, poke the actions and, and assert the outlets. Um, and what happens you know, underneath, I don't really care. Um, I think that's quite effective. The other, the other thing I've tried to do is actually to create the controller class with the nib. Um, I just added that for dramatic effect. <laughs> um, and actually testing that actually your, your outlets and your actions are configured correctly. Um, I, it sounds like a stupid thing to do. I, I don't know if anyone's actually tried to write unit tests for the kind of plumbing, the interface builder, and making sure your outlets aren't nil. I'm guessing not. You've, written, you've done it? Oh, awesome. He's on our team. <laughs> um, so I don't know, the only person I know who's done this on a full scale project swears that they were the most useful test they had and they caught so many problems because especially if people don't read their git commits really carefully and those kind of 
all the blobs that happen when you drag stuff around an interface builder, it's quite easy to accidentally break outlets. So the, they, the only person I know that did it swears that they were really useful, but uh, I'm still not convinced. Um, so I think those kind of errors would have such a large effect on your app that you're going to notice it straight away anyway. So the kind of test that we could do, I'm just going to go through a kind of sample test case for this Fibonacci counter. So we're going to be, you tap that next button and that has an action, you know, call a method. And we basically want to test that, you know, when we either call next or maybe we, we reset the counter, that the label gets updated properly. Too many underscores. Too many underscores. Yeah, so we can have an argument about this, but I, I think <laughs> this is basically just kind of set us all up for arguments at the pub. Um, I think that your test names should be really long and really readable, and I think Apple actually kind of does that in their own frameworks. It should be a string. But I, th <laughs> but I think when, you, when camel case gets really long, it gets unreadable. So I think that actually if you're going to have long readable test cases, they should actually use underscores. Um, or use a framework that allows you to use strings. Um, so the first thing I do in the, in the test is actually try and set up the environment separately from Interface Builder. So I'm actually creating a controller there with no nib, no bundle. So it's, it's kind of our independent object. And then I, I create our, like our own label. You could potentially use a kind of a stub object or a fake object, but the UI um, classes are so kind of small and simple that I think they're actually fine to use. Um, and they're, they're going to be the actual objects that are used when you actually plumb in your app, so it makes sense to use them. So I'd actually kind of can um, do those couple of lines of code to configure your controller and then perform the action. Just kind of say, hey, yeah, controller, reset the counter. Can you read that at the back? It's pretty small. Um, and then see what happens. So after we reset it, we make this assertion, this kind of statement that we think is true, that the, the text in the counter should be zero after you reset because that's the first number in the sequence. Um, so we'd write that, and firstly, it's not even going to compile because um, you know, the, the property doesn't exist. If we've just got a kind of empty view controller, none of this stuff exists. The method doesn't exist. And this is one of those things where I think you need to be pragmatic. You know, the, if you're doing it in Ruby or something, it's quite easy to write all your tests first <coughs> um, and kind of watch various bits fail and things like that. Um, Xcode really doesn't like it when your code's not compiling. So I think at, sometimes it's actually helpful to just go in and say, well, I need these properties and these methods and go and add them. Just empty implementations, you know, just return nil or do nothing or whatever you can do um, just to get your code compiling so that you actually get autocomplete and a bunch of other things when you're writing your tests. So I think that's one of those situations where, you know, you, you can, there's extremes that you can go to, but not all of them are practical. It's ultimately about getting, getting to the failing tests rather than compilers. Certainly, but I think a, not, not compiling is a failing test in, in Objective-C. Um, anyway, you press Command-U, uh, you run your tests, and you get this weird kind of message, null should be equal to zero. And so now we've got our failing test, we know it's working, we know it's running, then we just go and write the simplest code that we can to make it pass. So we actually go into our reset method, so you know what, it wants the text to be zero in the label, let's make the text zero. Um, you know, it's kind of a judgment call on how simple you say the simplest code that makes a pass is. Obviously that's not going to satisfy the requirements of the app going forward. I think you need to write more tests and build up that functionality. Um, but maybe the next point you could actually say, hey, let's keep a variable and actually write that um, into the label. Um, and then I think we actually want to test drive the Fibonacci algorithm. So when you tap next, it actually should start counting through the Fibonacci numbers. Um, so I was thinking of these because we're about to do a bunch of estimation at work and you, know, you often end up using Fibonacci numbers for that stuff. Um, if you get to 21 in your project estimation with Fibonacci numbers, you've probably got too many numbers. Um, so you might write a, usually write one test case at a time. I've just put a couple there. So I'd literally just make it really simple and say, you know what, if I tap the next button once, what should the number be? If I tap it twice, what should it be? If I tap it three times, what should it be? And basically keep building that up um, and write the simplest implementation that we can and eventually we'll end up with our entire algorithm. So, you know, the, the fact that the first Fibonacci number is zero, we don't even have to do anything. That just should be our default state. Um, the second one, we just have to, you know, equivalent of tapping the next button once and then assert that it's actually gone through. 
and the third one we're going to have to tap it uh, twice. And when we actually kind of write those tests and we go through and make our assertions of what we think the numbers should be, initially that's going to be red. Um, it's going to fail and so then we actually have to go in and start fleshing out our algorithm. And again, do the simplest thing that will make it work. Has anyone else had a car like that? This isn't actually my car, but yeah. <laughs> I had a car like that until the start of the year. It just went to car heaven. Um, but it was kind of, it had a windscreen, but it was all held together with gaffer tape. Um, so you do the simplest thing that will make it pass, knowing that eventually we build up our test suite, we end up with a full implementation, and we can go back and refactor. So that whole thing is keep writing tests and building that up until you have everything. Um, does anyone else find those pictures of the Empire State Building being built just kind of crazy? How many people died building that building? <laughs> um, so I'm not going to go through kind of all the code. I'm sure if, you know, if you did computer science at uni, you had to go through Fibonacci algorithms and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to go through a demo and show you that. But you can understand that you basically, once you get to a certain number of tests, the simplest code that you can do is actually the entire algorithm. And then once it's working, make it awesome. Um, it's going to be a Ferrari, but I don't really like new cars. I really like those kind of old English sports cars. Um, so make it awesome, also known as there is a step three. So red, green, refactor. So when you start doing this and you start driving your code from the controller down and from the actions, the simplest code is right there in the controller. And I'm sure you've all seen projects which the UI, UI view controllers end up with kind of you know, 5,000 lines of code and they're just impossible to maintain. So once we've got that functionality done, yeah, let's refactor that, let's extract out a model and, and, and kind of get that working. And when I say make it awesome for this, it's probably not an English sports car, it probably looks more like that. If you're a mathematician or that, if you think in Lisp, uh, that was for Kev, but he's not here. <laughs> Does anyone else do Lisp? I copied and pasted it from Wikipedia, so it might not be right. <laughs> Um, it's got lots of brackets, that's what I kind of think Lisp is. Um, <laughs> nice. Um, so when we refactor it, we might say, well look, we've only got these kind of basic behavior on our view controller, the fact that we can go next and we can reset. But we don't want all that logic and the calculation and the state of that in our view controller. I think when we write our code, that's kind of the quickest place to put it. But as soon as we've actually fleshed it out, we should extract that out. So we might extract out a, a model class um, where we can actually get the current number, we can get the next number and reset it all within this model. And, and then we've just got our button and our label. And it really makes our view controller just about plumbing. It's literally saying, hey, here's a view, here's a model, and kind of you know, plumbing messages together, which I think is what view controllers should be about. I don't think they should be about the application logic for your entire app. Um, so anyway, once you do that abstraction, um, you can basically set up, um, when you're testing your controller now, you don't really care about all the calculations. You actually care that it's correctly plumbed into the right model. So that's when you can start using mocks and stubs, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Um, it is possible to test a UI view controller lifecycle and nib and all that kind of stuff. Um, I won't dwell on this. There's a couple of blog posts about it. Um, so you can call controller.view or controller load view and then check that yeah, all your outlets aren't nil. Um, that's a fairly simple test to do. Um, there's this funky method that I never knew existed. The actions for target for control events. So if you can actually grab the button out of your controller, you can actually test that it's hooked up to the right actions. Um, you can also test that just by tapping the button and if it doesn't do anything, you've, you've got it wrong. Um, and if you've got kind of high level smoke tests that go through and poke your app, then I think that they'll catch that kind of thing as well. Um, one test which I think is potentially valid is actually checking that on memory warning that your controllers actually clean up after themselves because that's something that we often get wrong um, and it's not something we often test for. You know, we can simulate it in the, um, you know, iOS simulator, you can kind of fake a memory warning, but it's just not something that's in, at least in my regular kind of testing practices. So um, that's kind of easy one to do. This is the problem that triggered that whole do weak references get nilled out on the Koga heads list if you were reading that. Um, and for me, no they didn't, even though in ARC they should. So I actually had to, on view to unload, actually nil out my references. Um, still working out why that is, so I'm going to bug Oliver about it because he, he seemed to know. Uh, what about Kiwi? I said I'd talk about Kiwi. 
but that was when I thought that I was going to be using it every day for about three weeks before this. Um, I haven't I actually used it from about 10 p.m. to about 2 a.m. last night. Um, I've poked it at different times. So Kiwi is like a kind of R spec wrapper around OC unit. So What's if R -spec? so R spec, if you, I guess it's a Ruby testing tool, unit testing tool, which is, I guess, kind of block based, and and you kind of instead of writing it as an object, we say set up, you know, and you got all your test methods. You um, you kind of nest these kind of describe the behaviour. So it's real. It's partly a change in terminology. We actually say, you know, describe this um, this function in this context. It should do this. So it's kind of it's unit testing but with different language. Um, so that's that's really the main difference, I think. Um, it's uh, Kiwi. So Kiwi is quite nice. I it, it comes as a static library. Um, it's available on CocoaPods. Sorry, Keith. <laughs> um, yep. I only noticed that last night. Um, but also, um, I had to fork it and fix it to actually get the stake library to compile, so I'm not sure if the CocoaPods version works either. Um, so if you want to have a look at how it does, it basically uses a bunch of macros and blocks to try and set up these kind of nested definitions of your object structure. Um, so you basically have these kind of macros, spec begin and spec end. So even that change of terminology, it says it's a spec, a specification rather than a test. It kind of encourages you to think about writing your tests first as describing the behavior rather than writing your code and then trying to check that it did the right thing. Um, and if you've looked at R spec, this kind of stuff looks really neat. In Objective-C, because of the noisy syntax, it, it does kind of carry a little bit more weight. Um, but, you know, so you describe it, you can actually describe your tests the things that you're doing as strings, as Steve was saying before, so instead of having kind of camel case or underscore based things, you can actually have strings, which are a little bit easier for us to read. Um, and so you basically say, hey, you know, for our view controller, describe the Fibonacci number. When we reset, uh, we come down here, it should be zero. And so, um, and at any one of those levels, you can have before each test do this, uh, after each test do this. So it enables you to kind of um, focus your test down on specific behavior. And you get a much nicer test output because of this way you can describe it. Um, and it's got its own kind of assertion and mocking framework built in, which again, I only started using last night, but at least if you're used to RSpec, it reads much more nicely. Um, but I'm yet to see, I'm sure there's a couple of gotchas in there, which we'll find out in the coming weeks. Um, I was kind of thinking, is it just a change of wording? And I think it's more than that, and I think I've already touched on that, that I think changing the language of the way you talk about your tests is actually really important. So that kind of language as if you're describing the behaviour, I think is actually really important. It's not just a change of wording, it's a change of the way you think about it, encouraging you to write your tests first. Um, yeah, I've already mentioned that. It comes with mocks and stubs. Um, so say we just wanted to test our controller now with this new layout, that we basically just want to test that it's got the plumbing right. Um, I did this example in Kiwi because I didn't want to have to pull in OC mock into my demo project or anything like that. Um, so to test that, um, I've just got a little blob of code. and So it's, it's quite easy to basically set up a, a mock model object. So back in our, um, if it's going to let me go back far enough, we don't want to use a real model in our test. We want to kind of just stub that out and separate them out. Um, so we're actually going to create a kind of fake fiber object that just kind of checks that we pass it the right thing and we can kind of make it return hard-coded values. Um, so we actually create a, create a mock of that and then we say, hey, our mock object should receive the next selector and when it does, we want it to return the value three. Um, so again, the syntax is noisy, but if you actually just read it out, it kind of starts to read like English. Um, and then we plumb that into our controller and we just say, hey, when we call next, then we say, well, you know, the text should be three because that's what the model's going to tell you. And, and Kiwi automatically verifies that if you kind of set up things that, you know, you expect to be called, we expect the next method to be called on, on our model object, Kiwi automatically kind of verifies that after the test. So if you ever used OC mock and you had to go through and actually manually verify them all, uh, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, that's really racing through what Kiwi can do. I think um, it's, yeah, if someone uses it in more detail, I'd love to hear your experiences. 
Um, this is going to go for too long, and we can't talk for testing about testing for that long, because we'll get really bored. So I'm just going to whip through running it from the command line. Um, Apple does allow it now, but it's a pain. Apple doesn't get CI, and it's really annoying. Um, Xcode build is your friend until it unfriends you. It, it, <laughs> it, 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 it takes you out of its circles. Yeah, yeah, it's not in the circles. Um, for, for those three people that are still using Google+. Plus. Um, but it, Xcode build enables you to kind of run and compile all your targets from the command line. And if you're running your unit tests and you run build, it will run your unit tests. If they're logic tests, it won't run your application tests. Um, but again, the Long Weekend Mobile guys had a nice blog post about how you can go into the shell script inside your kind of Xcode tools and comment out some stuff and make it. It can do what you want from the command line. For some reason, it doesn't. Um, so the Xcode build command kind of looks, you know, looks like this. If you just do look at the man page, you'll see all the options. Um, I think um, Ray Hilton, who's not here, has been working on a little gem that kind of wraps some of this stuff, I think, and makes it a little bit easier. I'm sure some other people have done that as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you want it to work, hack that file. Um, or even better, make a copy of it and use that rather than hacking your actual Xcode directory, which is what I did. Um, so just quickly, um, this has been a little bit of a lightning kind of go through. I've probably tried to cover a little bit too much information, but there's a bunch of good resources. The iDeveloper TV guys wrote a full kind of video course on this stuff. It's, um, it's 70 bucks, but it really is worthwhile. And they basically give a far better presentation than I do, and they go through kind of 10 different case studies. Um, and I think it's, it's really worthwhile, and it's something you can just sit back on your iPad. It's not really fast paced. You can kind of keep it kind of going at the same time as doing your email or something like that. Um, I won't even try and pronounce this guy's name, uh, his surname, Doug. He writes a bunch of um, test driven development posts on the idea of Blogger Day at the moment. So I think he's writing four posts. Two of them have already come out. I think they they step through from the start. They're really worth looking at. Um, the Prague Prog magazine had a nice article on some of this stuff last year, and that's free. Um, and a shameless, shameless plug. I I'm spending a lot of time looking at this stuff at the moment, and I've started writing a few blog articles, and I'm going to be writing a lot more. So if you're interested in this space, um, yeah. Watch that space, and hopefully there'll be some useful information there. Um, yeah, so I think we'll leave it there. Thanks. Many thanks to Stuart for presenting this month. Thanks also to the York Butter Factory for hosting this month's event. You can learn more about this excellent co-working facility at yorkbutterfactory.com. If you would like to know more about Melbourne Cocoa Heads, visit us on the web at melbournecocoaheads.com or follow Melbourne Cocoa on Twitter.